Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We are in the second webinar of the Trevor Platt Science Foundation. And today we have with us the presenter, Dr. Vicky Chung. The title of the presentation is Project Management and Preparing Project Proposals. During this session, there will be an overview of the key elements of project management. And we will discuss how this is relevant to anyone who is planning on conducting a research project and is presently undertaking a research project. Some insight into the consideration one should make when preparing a project proposal and applying for research funding will also be shared. To introduce the speaker, Dr. Vicky Chung, she is having a background in science with a graduation in geology. She has got masters in marine science and a PhD in genetic ecotoxicology. She has got 15 years of experience in event and project management in both private and academic sectors. She is now project manager at uh, University of Plymouth. And prior to this, she was working with Plymouth Marine Laboratory, where she fulfilled the role of scientific coordinator for the Secretariat of the Partnership for Observation of the Global Oceans, which is acronymed as POGO. She has recently completed the role of project manager for a pound 6.7 million grand for the UK Research and Innovations GCRF Blue Communities Program, working with international partners from Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, and the UK, and currently provides project management on several research projects, including the GCRF Pieces Project, the NERC Bioplastic Risk Project, and is the center manager for a new center of doctoral training in sustainable management of UK marine resources. Earlier in her research career, Vicky also conducted research projects that involved laboratory and field-based research investigating the sublethal biological effects of contaminants, where she did her PhD in ecotoxicology using biomarkers in marine invertebrates. With this small introduction, I welcome today's speaker and request her to take over the session. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you very much, uh, Grinson, for the warm welcome. And uh, thank you to Shuba and Nandini, Anoop, and her colleagues at the Travel Platt Science Foundation for inviting me to present and share some of the things that I've learned along the way as my journey along uh, being a project manager. So as uh, Grinson mentioned, I've uh, been a project manager for several research projects um, now here at the University of Plymouth in the United Kingdom. And it was actually through my role previously as a scientific coordinator at POGO that I gained actually a huge amount of experience and learned many, many lessons about project management and also learned about the value of capacity building and sharing knowledge widely. So um, in today's session, I will be focusing on the key elements, so more theoretical elements of project management, and I'll talk about how this is relevant to everyone who conducts research projects. Uh, I will then briefly talk about how uh, project management skills will help, uh, hopefully, each of you with preparing project proposals when you're responding to a call from funders. So um, before I make a, a start, it would be helpful for me to see, and I'd be interested to hear, um, where you're from, really, who I'm speaking to, and um, would like to ask those of you who have um, access to a computer, or if you have a smartphone, uh, go to menti.com and enter the code 77302644, or if you have a smartphone, you can just take a picture of the QR code on the screen, and that should take you to a um, screen with basically questions to sort of hear about where you're, you're coming from. You can give feedback on um, how, you're, how you're joining us. And um, first of all, um, one thing I'd be interested to hear is really where, where are you joining us from today? Which country are you joining us from? So you can type in the name of the country and then press submit. And uh, that will give me an idea of what time zone you're in. I uh, appreciate that some of you are in India. So it's late in the evening for you. Thank you for joining us and um, hear from you where, whereabouts you're, what you're, you're no, where in the world you're joining us from. Vicky, can so, you just say a mentee code in the chat, please? It's um, 
on the top of the screen. It's uh, 7730. Two six four four. So it's at the top of the the page there. So hopefully you can see. And a few people have answered. So I can know that Lika is in Portugal. So uh, <laughs> I can identify you. And uh, someone from Germany. So a few people from India. And uh, yeah. Okay. So link and code is in the chat now. Thank, thank you. you. So most of you from joining us from India, Bangladesh. So uh, nice to see some international participants here. So I'll just move on now to the um, next question. And um, to, to sort of make me kind of understand which stage you are in your career, that would be helpful for me to um, sort of highlight some of the areas that would be most relevant perhaps to yourself. So uh, to let me know which stage uh, you are in your career, what, what level you're at, um, and see that there's a few of you who are managers, so you're, you're supervising researchers, perhaps rather than conducting the research yourselves. And um, have a few master's level participants and a couple of PhD people doing PhDs and some postdoc fellows as well. So there's a um, nice range of different stages that uh, you are all at. So yeah, thank you very much for, um, for participating in that. I will now just go back to the presentation. And I just need to move a few of my little screens around because I've got too many screens taking up my computer. So hopefully now you can see um, the overview of what I'll be talking to today. And today I'll be describing some, some of the, starting with the basics really, um, what a project is. I'll give an overview of what the different elements and functions of project management are. I'll be outlining what the role and responsibilities of a project manager are. And I'll touch upon the main challenges to consider for a project manager. And then um, I'll discuss um, how all of this fits together for a research project. Um, so how that might be relevant to you as a researcher. And um, I'll just briefly touch upon how to highlight your particular project management skills when you're preparing submitting project proposals, for example, if you're looking for a PhD position or if you're applying for a research fellowship or research funding, the sorts of things that you should really focus upon to make sure that your project proposal is really coherent and uh, comprehensive to cover actually many aspects which come under the remit of project management. So all of you have um, I see most of you have uh, at least done a master's, so you, all of you have had to complete projects for your academic studies. And so you will have already have had some experience of undertaking these projects. So how does this differentiate between something that is a project and what is not? Um, so a project is defined as a specific finite activity that produces an observable and measurable result under certain preset requirements. And according to the Project Management Institute, the term project refers to any temporary endeavor with a definite beginning and end. So this is where it differs from other types of work, such as tasks and procedures, which would otherwise be considered as operations management, which is a continuous and ongoing process and has no definite end date. So this could apply, a project could apply from anything from organizing a surprise party for a friend or a family member to completing a thesis within a set deadline or even taking on a more complicated project with set starts and endpoints. That's the fundamental difference. Uh, so when you're undertaking any research project, you'll be needing to apply some of these project management skills that I'll be talking about. So traditionally, um, project management includes a number of elements. These are the key elements. Uh, these may be four or five project management process groups. There'll be um, and a control system. And regardless of the methodology or terminology used, same basic project management processes or stages of development will be used. 
uh, major process groups generally include initiating, planning, production or executing, monitoring and controlling, and closing the project. So we'll just drill in a bit more into a bit more detail on each of these elements. And uh, there are uh, some key main stages in that project management within, there are functions within each, each with each a different purpose. So a project begins with the project definition and then proceeds to planning, moves to control, and often research projects Initially, the first function, the project definition, is prepared during the pre-award stage, where a proposal is prepared in response to a call from funders or grant providers. And then once a grant is awarded, the next function, project planning, is required to detail how the project will be implemented and outline the plan for the activities, including identifying the resource requirements, how the project team is built, and the more detailed levels. And then as the project is executed and underway, the function of project control enables the progress of the project to be measured. Uh, risks need to be monitored and mitigated and communication of the project pro progress is enabled with the various stakeholders and the project is closed out at conclusion. Sometimes it will be found that actually these functions are repeated many times and then planning might lead to modifications in the definition and controlling actions uh, might require changes to the planning. So during a project, project manager will spend time con continuously engaging with all three functions of one project, reviewing, refining, and reviewing again certain aspects of each of those functions. So they may change as you make progress through the project. And um, uh, as you will find, particularly with larger projects, inevitably things not always necessarily go exactly to plan so you need to review continuously. And then that might then change again the project definition and how that might be reset. So in the past, uh, my children have asked me, Mummy, what, what do you do? What does a project manager do? And I try to explain to them that a project manager is someone who is responsible for managing a piece of work from the concept to delivery, but it's not limited to qualifications or background. Uh, for example, for myself, I never had a formal qualification in project management, um, but actually learned uh, on the job, so to speak, and um, progressed to uh, project man manage many different projects. Um, but actually, it applies to anyone and everyone who finds themselves managing a project that uh, they need to ensure that they deliver those on time and within budget. So it's really more a question of what doesn't a project manager do? in terms of the research projects you're working on now or you might do in the future you'll be the project manager and along with your team and colleagues you'll need to plan together the various processes outlined just now so some of the responsibilities of a project manager include the project definition so generally that would be the principal investigator who comes out with the project the project manager then will also be responsible for documentation management. So these might be any documents relating to the project, including contractual agreements between the funder and the principal investigator, perhaps agreements between partners, uh, the reporting templates, budget reports, research ethics applications if needed, and uh, data management policies, and so on. And um, the project manager engages with the stakeholders, uh, making implementation plans for the project, allocates resources. These might be financial or recruitment of team members and staff. They um, are responsible for leading and motivating the team and monitoring progress. And uh, as well as that, they need to review the risks and issues and mitigate the potential impacts of these as far as possible. And the project manager is involved in the delivery and control of the project itself. Also managing the budget, which is really important, and uh, manages the dependencies where one activity or task might be dependent on the delivery of another task. Um, they'll be likely to have to attend governance meetings and ensure the quality and control of the deliverables and administrative processes and manage change. So earlier on, we talked about how as the, the project progresses, 
might have to change some of the, the original plans. But uh, things like scope creep is something to be aware of. So if, if things change too much, then that can make things very difficult as well. And then uh, the project manager needs to close the project. So ensure that all loose ends are tied up, any final reports, any budgetary um, financial um, auditing is, is followed up on and also review the lessons learned. And the more projects you do, the more lessons there are to be learned as each time there are different aspects that have to be addressed. So in reality, um, project managers are not always involved from the project definition stage. So that's when the project is prepared and submitted. And they might actually only be recruited once the project has been awarded the funding. And this was actually the case for Moral as a for a project um, called the Blue Communities Project, which was a GCRF project, which uh, had a, a large budget of 6.7 million and involved 10 partner organizations. So really a very large project, um, but I wasn't involved at all in the proposal stage. And uh, in that case, I had to get up very get, get up to speed very quickly and familiarize myself with all aspects of the project that had been outlined in the proposal and find out what had been communicated with the stakeholders and the partners that had been engaged. And this included the scope of the project, anticipated deliverables of outcomes and the work breakdown structure, as well as the timelines and the budget. So to start with, the project manager should have a very clear understanding of the project's goals and objectives to ensure the vision is clear and all team members understand them and understand what the expectations are. The roles of the team members need to be defined so that any dependencies across the team can be um, identified early on and progress can be monitored and individuals responsibilities are set out. The milestones and deliverables and associated deadlines should vote be very clear and these should be communicated with all of the team members. And the budget and financial rules uh, needs to be well understood and uh, such things like templates and managing and monitoring budgets should be followed to ensure the project is delivered within the awarded budget and uh, ensure that people spend to the budget according to what is allowed by the funder. And then there's the continuous risk assessment and management, uh, which I mentioned earlier, which enables any issues to be mitigated. So what are the main challenges um, for a project manager that they need to be aware of and uh, how are these, co uh, these constraints um, how can they influence the way that uh, a project is managed? So these are the key constraints that uh, we should consider. Cost is a very important um, um, element, which, is, uh, which will be known at the very beginning of the project with the project sponsor will, having, uh, will have expectations from the project. And this includes the amount of spend that will be allowed within the, the budget. The project scope defines what needs to be completed in the project and this uh, will have been set out in the proposal which was submitted to win the funding in the first place. Quality is a consideration and comes with cost. Um, if there are strict quality requirements in the project this will affect the cost constraint directly. If the higher quality of a project is constraint you should be aware that this constraint needs to align in the project. Customer satisfaction is a key factor for sustainable and long running business in the market. So in the case of research projects, the customer is often the funder because they are the source of the funding. Uh, if you deliver well, you'll be in good stead for future projects with those funders. Additionally, there may be stakeholders who you need to consult with to gather data and you must keep them informed of progress and findings. Otherwise, relationships with the BDAP could be damaged and they may be reluctant to work with researchers in future projects. So risks may be either positive or negative in a project and project managers need to enhance the opportunities of positive risks and reduce the threats of negative risks in the project. For instance, if there's a risk of losing a project team member because they may might be um, mid-career and likely to move on to a different post, you should prepare 
for that and have a handover document for the activities for which that team member is doing in the project. And if that team member then leaves the project, um, in other words, if the risk actually occurs, you can then use the handover documents to assign tasks to a new member of team, a new member of the team, and reduce the potential impacts of that risk. So risk is a very critical project constraint in project management. Resources are a very important constraint, and many project managers think that only project team members are considered project resources. However, you need to also think about tools or equipment or materials that will be used during the project. These are all project resources, and as well as project constraints respectively. For example, computers, software, office space, transport links that will be used during the project. These are all project resources and project constraints at the same time. And time. Time, as mentioned earlier, is what defines a project. Uh, that is one with an endpoint. So when starting with a project, there will also be deadlines that would be proposed by the project sponsor, for example, regular reports on project progress and or financial expenditure. And these will form time constraints in the project. And a project manager will need to consider how those constraints might affect one another. In a very simplistic uh, term, there are ways to manage and address these challenges. For costs, you need to ensure that budgets are monitored and kept up to date continuously and regularly review the allocations to the resources. So if you overspend on a certain aspect, you might need to cut back on another aspect of your budget if it's allowed. For scope, uh, to manage change in the team or scope creep that I mentioned earlier, you may need to reallocate tasks to either um, another person or to, uh, to new team members and be agile in your approach. This is often the case in research. Uh, so for example, your intermediary findings may be really interesting and you might find yourself drawn into other research that was not set out in the original proposal. But you need to be careful that team members or certain aspects of the project do not go down what we might call a rabbit hole and veer too far away from the original objectives without the ration, rational decisions being made collectively by the team. For um, quality assurance, it is important to instill a sense of pride in the team members to maintain quality outputs. And for uh, customer uh, satisfaction, you should maintain communication, report the activities conducted through the project and celebrate achievements. When thinking about the risks, you need to identify any potential risks as early as possible and assess contingency plans and continuously review and consider whether the risks might increase or decrease in either their likelihood or their impact over the lifetime of the project. For resources, these, these may be in human resources, infrastructure or facilities. You need to identify gaps as early as possible and find ways to fill those gaps. And for time constraints, you need to continuously review the timelines for activities and deliverables, and see how they might match again against the deadlines. Again, we need to be agile in the approach. So generally, there is a trade-off between these project constraints. For example, if you improve positive aspects in, the, in one project constraint, this might bring a negative impact or negative aspects on another project constraint. For example, in order to reduce the delivery duration of the project, so the time, um, or in order to deliver the project earlier than the scheduled time, you might need to put in extra resources to deliver the same amount of work in a shorter time. So this would mean increasing the cost, or if you don't put in extra resources, you might need to reduce your scope to deliver less work in a shorter time scale. If you try to deliver more with the same amount of resources, but in a shorter time scale, this will cause um, a problem in delivery of your deliverables with faults, which might then uh, mean lower quality. And this might also decrease the customer satisfaction in the end. So you can see one impact with, on one constraint might um, affect all of the other constraints in the chain. And these are some of the challenges that the project managers need to be aware of. But the main thing I'd like to highlight is to manage all of the aspects of project teamwork and communication are the true keys to success 
It is important to capitalise on the strengths of your team members and keep team members informed and keep the dialogue flowing both ways. So you need to keep on your toes all the time. So whilst that was just a very brief introduction to the processes, the theoretical processes involved in project management, um, there are plenty of resources out there. If you put in the search for um, in the search engine for the term project management, a huge number of results come up. And um, there are you know, a whole a huge, a huge number of places where you can look for advice and guidance. Um, but here is uh, just a handful that might be useful to yourself, such as a blog on how to make a great project manager. The second one here might be of interest, uh, might be of interest to you if you are planning to work on projects with international partners. And um, I would advise that you enroll on training courses and apply a methodological approach in all aspects of managing projects of any type. So those are some of the theoretical principles in project management, but how does everything fit together for you in your research project? So during your academic experiences, you would have received training in some of the aspects of research activities, such as risk assessment in, return, in relation to field safety, perhaps, or statistical analysis, good laboratory practice, perhaps, um, working with literature and using resources for searching for previous papers. And maybe you may have received some training on uh, overviews of communicating science using different methods, such as peer reviewed papers, posters at conferences or social media. And all of these are important skills and should be considered and included in the where, where they're appropriate if you're preparing a research project proposal. Whether your project is already funded or if you are preparing a proposal, proposal for a project to be funded, you'll need to think about the availability of your resources at different stages of your project. Often in project proposals, you're expected to provide a justification of resources. So make sure you're aware of what your budget might be um, for example, you need to make sure that you um, accurately try to forecast what it might cost for travel and consumables, what support staff you might need, um, what access to laboratories and or equipment you might need, and what software will be required to collect, store and analyse your data. And when considering the research questions you're going to try to answer, in other words, your hypothesis, check that this work hasn't already been done by someone else by doing a, a literature review. Your research should be novel and not simply a repeat of someone else's work. If other researchers have done something similar before, you should critically review what they've done and explain why you're doing it differently. The purpose of your research is to fill a gap in the knowledge in the topic of interest. You'll need to think about the processes that you have to consider, such as the health and safety forms, whether you need to apply for research ethics if you're if you're working with human participants, or if you might need research permit, permits, or for example, if you're removing samples from the field, such as organisms or sediment samples, you may need to complete forms that are required by your local governments. Here in the UK, it is Natural England that we have to report to for such sampling and you need to factor all of those aspects in when looking at your timelines. And think about things that might not go to plan, not try to be pessimistic, but uh, you always uh, try to have a, a plan B or even the plan C in mind. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's very rare that projects go exactly to plan, particularly those that extend over longer periods of time. So consider the timeline and um, any dependencies or activities of outputs that might cause a bottleneck in the progress of your project. If, for example, you're depending on a supervisor giving you feedback or you need to book um, equipment or consumables that need to be delivered, or you might have seasonal variances that might affect your work, you must have a contingency plan to consider those aspects that might not quite go to the timescales you are anticipating. Referring back to my earlier slide, remember that teamwork and communication are really important considerations. So if there are any plan B or C that might have to be taken in place, make sure that everyone who's involved in your project is aware of those aspects as well. So when you're writing a research proposal, you need to identify the general study area and give the rationale for the work, the relevance to others, 
potential scientific, practical and or socioeconomic benefits and look at previous work and make sure you cite them appropriately. And then choose your research topic. What research questions are you trying to answer? What is your hypothesis? And what is novel about your research? You need to formulate the plan and methodology. Think about what needs to be done and what order. Do you need the permissions to do the work? Um, or do you need extra additional training? You might be adopting and established methods or you might be refining and adapting new strategies to enhance existing methods. And it's really important that you know what statistical analysis that you will be planning to apply and ensure that you've designed your protocol to apply these statistical methods, which might then feed back and influence your actual research topic. And then going on to the research activity itself, you need to think about how to collect the data making sure you have a data management plan, um, including how backups will be held, how data will be archived, who you'll be sharing the data with, and how long the data will be stored. And you will need to consider how uh, you're going to analyze and interpret the data, making sure that you have access to the software uh, and or the mentoring even that you might be needing to undertake the analysis. And you should also think about how you're going to present your findings the whole range of variety of ways to uh, pro provide your research outputs and present your findings and the platforms and methods uh, that you will use will depend on the audience that you're trying to reach. So going on from that, um, it's advisable to think about uh, uh, preparing a communications plan for your research outputs and how you might present your results. Hopefully you'll have aspirations that your work will be seen by other audiences and you're not just going to spend your time and energy doing research or writing a thesis that's just going to sit on your bookshelf or in your computer only to be seen by perhaps your supervisors. So you need to think about why you're doing the research. Why is this important? Ask yourself the so what question. Think about who you would like to reach with your findings and depending on your target audience, how you're going to do this. So are you trying to disseminate your work to academic researchers, for example, through peer-reviewed papers or scientific conferences, or are you trying to reach policymakers, in which case you might need to present the findings in a more, more easily digestible format, such as a policy brief. Or if you're trying to share the knowledge to the wider public to change their behaviours, um, you need to present that differently again, or if your objective is to raise your own profile for potential employers, in, in which case social media or blogs could be a way of communicating your work. And don't forget the messages can also be communicated through different types of media, such as animations and infographics or art. So ultimately, you're aiming to have as much impact as possible with the research that you're conducting. So, this may not be applicable for everybody, depending on which stage of your career you are, you're at at the moment. Um, and most of these are actually applicable for those looking for funding from the UK, because this is the area that I'm most familiar with. But if uh, anyone is looking, for, uh, doing, looking to do a PhD, then uh, there are a whole lots of uh, different options for um, looking for PhDs. There are a number of uh, research councils which offer funding for PhD study in the UK, and they don't necessarily offer these directly, but perhaps provide a set amount of funding to universities who then decide which PhD projects or students should um, be awarded funding to. And um, many adverts for PhDs can be found on sites such as findaphd.com. Um, some PhD projects can be um, through networks such as doctoral training partnerships or centers for doctoral training. And in fact, this time of year is a good time to apply for some of these sorts of PhDs through these doctoral training partnerships or center of doctoral trainings with uh, many of the deadlines for applications often closing in mid-January um, for a PhD starting in the next academic year in October. For those of you already on a PhD programme, there are opportunities for applying for postdoctoral funding, 
Um, as a postdoc, you're actually training to become an independent researcher. So one way to demonstrate um, how, you're, how you're independent is by getting your own funds. And then these can be through fellowships, um, sometimes mobility schemes, enabling you to go abroad for postdoctoral research experiences. Um, travel fellowships might be available if the destination country is the focus of your research. Or um, for more experienced postdocs, there are opportunities to apply for funding to start a new lab or a research group. For those of you further on in your career, you should, you should try to subscribe to alerts for research grants that are calling for research project proposals. Um, here at the University of Plymouth, we have a system called Research Professional, where you can um, subscribe and receive uh, alerts for relevant grants in your particular area of research. I'm sure there are many others um, internationally as well. And finally, if you're thinking of continuing to undertake research and looking for jobs in the field of research rather than staying in, in, um, in academia and studying, here are some other examples of places to look. Um, if you, and if you can, it's good to volunteer for positions that give you more experience and gain additional skills, as all opportunities um, that you undertake will give you more scope to get a good reference for your CV and widen your contacts and networks, which will be good for future decisions. And again, here's some more resources that you might find useful for planning research. Um, there's a whole series of step-to-step uh, -step guides on how to plan research um, and various um, publications, how to develop a research proposals. And essentially for everything that you do for your research, um, you must have the ability to write well. Uh, there are many resources available and something you should aspire to continue, continually develop and improve upon are your academic writing skills to be able to express your critical thinking clearly. And the only real way to do this is to practice and write lots and read lots, read plenty of plenty of different styles of literature and practice again and again. So hopefully you will have, uh, that was a very, very quick overview, but so hopefully you will have drawn some useful information from today's session. Uh, I will be open to take some questions from the audience shortly and invite any panel members to join me to answer those. But uh, before that, please uh, could we return to the Menti surveys and go through some final, um, some final questions. So I'll just, um, to the next next mentee, which is a, a different code this time, four six two zero nine five three four. Or again, you can try the QR code if you have a a smartphone. And the first question that's come that I'd like you to think about is. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just interesting to hear from you what you think is the most important thing when considering to start your project. Do you think it's most important to know what resources you will need? Having a clear research question or hypothesis? Knowing how much budget you have? Being aware of what deliverables are expected? Uh, being aware of the risks and possible problems? So which of those do you think? And don't be influenced by other people's answers because as I say, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just uh, Can we choose all see. of them? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good point, I guess. So yeah, they are all important, but which do you think is the most important? So it looks like the majority thinking think that having a clear research research question and hypothesis or hypotheses possibly um, are the most important. So thank you for that. It's interesting. And now think about for your current position, if you wanted to share your research findings and results, who would be your target audience? So you can type in who you think that might be.
So might be, I won't give you any answers because then you'll just uh, type in what I say. But uh, we mentioned this earlier and um, be interesting to see from your perspective who, who, who you would like to share your findings with. So students, other students, other scientists and researchers, health and public sector, that's interesting. And um, stakeholders. So hopefully by reaching stakeholders and sharing your findings with them, that might change their perception and influence the way that they manage, manage their marine environment or so on. Governments, ECOPS. So the public seems to be the most popular. So that's uh, something to think about when you're preparing your communication methods. How would you reach the wider public if that is uh, who you're trying to reach? Fisherman community. Once again, you know, the way that you engage with those very specific communities takes time to build trust with those stakeholders. And the way that you do that must be very clear and um, very open with them as to how the research that you're doing might help them in their communities. So the next question is, um, there's four options here and I'd like you to consider ranking the reasons why we think we should do research. And again, there's no right or wrong, but this is a very much a personal perspective. Uh, would you think that you want to do research so that you can share knowledge and educate others or to influence policymakers to build your publication record or simply because it's interesting? and uh, rank which of those you think to you is most important. And see the answers are starting to come in. And in actual fact, you know, sharing knowledge and educating others and influencing policymakers, you know, that there is an overlap there because ultimately by sharing your knowledge and the findings that you have might influence those making decisions at policy level. So that is, uh, there is an overlap there. There isn't, a, as I say, clear cut for any particular category there. But it's uh, interesting that um, the majority of you do research because you want to share knowledge and educate others, which is really fantastic because that would be my personal <laughs> number one as well. So thank you so much for your time and listening to me today. Um, if you have any feedback on today's session, you've got the opportunity to type something in in the um, Mentimeter game. So if you think it was too short, please say so. Uh, or if it was too long, please say so. And in the meantime, I will um, consult with um, the others to see if there are any questions that may have been coming up 